how well did you know John Wooden? And if you could boil down everything that he did and describe to people the essence of what made him a great coach, what would you say that was? These men that came to us out of the Depression, Tex Winter, John Wooden, um, there's a lot of guys, Everett Bunn, uh, Dr. Dean, uh, coaches that coached, that came out of an area in which we, you know, have called our, you know, our era that was, you know, a depression, hardships, you know, real study in life lessons and life you know, goals, have brought basketball a very um, generous legacy. Um, their ability to uh, not only build systems of basketball, but also, you know, coordinate almost a whole philosophical existence around them, a whole ability, a working behavioral model. That translates outside of the court. It translates outside of the court. Everybody who touches the, you know, the confines of, uh, you know, maybe UCLA, not everybody per se, but most everybody, John Wooden, had ability to coach for four years, improve their life, improve them as students. You know, I knew him casually until I came back that year. I had a hiatus. Um, I did my South Sea journey. I came back in Tex Winter, and I made a date with John to have lunch with him. And, and he John, and Tex were rivals. Big rivals. Tex is at Washington, and, you know, John Wooden was at UCLA, and Washington ended up second to UCLA those two or three years that uh, Tex was at Washington. Um, and so we went up to his house and we spent a couple hours with him in his home. And he had a special home and a special relationship to his house. He kept his bed a certain way because of his wife. He you know, tucked himself right. in and right. made the bed. And she passed away and he left everything pretty exactly, much the same. Exactly, exactly the same. And uh, the house was kind of dedicated to her. And we went to lunch with him at his favorite lunch spot. We ran into Chick Hearn's wife, Marge. He, she was about 88, he was 94, 95, and he called her a spring chicken when he said, <laughs> you know. He had that Zen thing going, you know. He was very much about even keel, don't get very too high, don't so. get too low. Very much so. He was the Zen master of his day. They just didn't call it that back then. We talked about a lot of what basketball should look like. What, what's the progression of basketball as you see it? It's progressed to this phase. What's going to be the next progression? Lengthening the court, making the baskets higher, talked about a lot of those futuristic things. We talked about former players that he'd had. Um, some of the, the great players, uh, Walt Hazard, uh, uh, Yale Goodrich, uh, the era before, you know, Kareem, Keith Erickson, that era that was before uh, Lou Alcindor came and really made that program dominant for six years or so, six, seven years. And um, we talked about uh, you know, players he'd seen at UCLA. Talked about Jackie Robinson, who is a UCLA grad or UCLA sure. football player. And he told he's much better football player than perhaps a baseball player, but here he is a Hall of Fame baseball player. And then you go back and look at what you know, the quotes he's made, the pyramid of success. You know, he's a very thoughtful guy about how these things had to be done. And um, you know, just, just how things had to develop and, you know, right down to tying your shoes. He taught players how to tie their shoes. Very precise guy. I get the feeling talking to people that we both know, people that you've coached, that you do not have a very high opinion of college basketball. Is that just maybe as it compares to the NBA, or do you pay attention to college basketball? Give me, a, give me, a, give me the view of college basketball from where you sit. Okay, to be critical. Go for it. But the NBA has distorted the college game, don't you think? Now that we have kids going to one and done, they're going to college before they come in. Now we made 19. We've got kids going to college. They don't learn. Students, they don't become students. They get by in a college curriculum for one semester. They don't go to class the second semester. Then college becomes a basketball venue for them. Then they jump to the NBA. Now they're 19 years old. They still can't play professionally. They're talented, really talented. But they're not professional athletes. We need to make that 20, at least.
You see these kids in the NCAA tournament that play four years of college basketball, mid-majors. They all of a sudden pop up in the top final four, sweet 16. Because they know how to play. These kids know how to play. And they know how to win. They've been skilled in the basketball skills. They've learned team chemistry. And it's just not about talent. And so we have to get away from that. And hopefully the NBA will move to one more year, 20. Uh, make it 20. Two years of college becomes the norm. Kids become students for you know, at least a year and a half. And then they learn something. They have to learn. Do you watch much college basketball during the week? Are you a channel surfer? No, I don't. I, I don't spend a whole lot of time. Someone will say, you know, Gonzaga's playing or a program I like, you know, to watch and see how they're coaching their team. And I'll go watch that team. The Butler coach is a good coach. He made the step into the NBA. I like the way he handled his team. I like his progressive thinking about basketball. I would have a hard time envisioning you as a college basketball coach stepping into the recruiting world. And you do great at the coaching part and the teaching part and the relationship part. Yeah, how do, you, how do you go in and recruit these players? And so, you know, the college coaches are left, you know, wondering how they can do it. I, I spent time with Larry Kraskowiak, who's at the University of Utah, a former player of mine and a guy that coached the uh, Milwaukee right. Bucks and a guy I admired as a player, actually. Uh, talking to him about recruiting. He gave me a couple stories about recruiting. It was just, you know, awful stories about how these kids are controlled and uh, manipulated and, uh, you know, used by outside influences that change the course of their lives, how they get through prep schools. And there's a way to clean this up and make it better, I think. The outside limit, though, is the NBA has got such a lure. There's a hundred million dollars to be made in the NBA. And so anything can happen.